four of us left the pleasant company of our English friends and headed together into the border region of Scotland. Traffic, once thick, soon slowed to just a single lane as we entered the hilly country of southern Scotland, where border reavers once roamed and raided during the times of the Stuart kings in Scotland and the Tudor dynasty of England. Our first stop once we entered Scotland was at Hadrian's Wall. This wall was the most important monument that was built by the Romans in Britain. It was built by Emperor Hadrian, who visited the wall in 122 A.D. The wall stood 80 miles long, 9 feet wide, and 20 feet tall, intended to secure the northernmost border of the mighty and majestic Roman Empire. But today, well, today that wall has crumbled like the empire that built it. Its remains stand only a few feet tall, unguarded, and tourists climb and walk along it playfully, looking out at the sheep in the neighboring pastures. The next stop, just up the road, was Lanercost Priory, only a short drive from Hadrian's Wall, and it is a place of peace and beauty, but that tranquility uh, denies or hides its very turbulent past. Robert the Bruce himself once raided the Priory, and King Edward I and his entourage stayed there for five months in 1306, and in the process nearly bankrupted the place. Today, the Priory's remains form a dramatic and beautiful silhouette. Its tall walls, great arches, and glassless windows a reminder only of its former grandeur and beauty. Once a place of great influence and worship, tourists now wander the grounds and ponder what once was. That night, asleep in Edinburgh, I had a dream. I was at United Lutheran Church right here, right near downtown Grand Forks. And I walked down this hallway to the sanctuary, as I often do, and people were passing me, but I didn't see any familiar faces. And I listened for Lynn because I thought she would be practicing the organ, but the only sound I heard were low, hushed voices coming from the sanctuary. And stepping through the doors into this worship space, I could see that the pews were all gone. The floor was now grass, and the wall stretched up to a roofless opening. The mosaic was crumbling. The tourists were walking along in front of it, admiring what remained of a once beautiful piece of liturgical art. It seems that nothing in this world really lasts. The Roman Empire and many of Christendom's great monuments have fallen. And someday, perhaps, even this place so precious to us will no longer stand. So what is it that does endure? In this morning's Gospel reading, Jesus and his disciples are in the temple in Jerusalem. And the temple stood there as a massive and magnificent monument that faithful Jews believed housed the very presence of God on this earth. And in the temple that day, people were speaking with one another, and they were talking about the temple, admiring it, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and gifts that had been dedicated to God. And Jesus, as he listened in on this, said to them simply, this temple will not last. Jesus interrupts their conversation and tells them about the coming destruction of the temple to let them know the temporary nature of every human institution and achievement. By the time Luke actually wrote his gospel, put pen to paper, 
to tell his story of Jesus. Well, the temple had, in fact, been destroyed by Roman forces that had violently taken the entire city of Jerusalem. The words of Jesus that Luke records here are a kind of writing that's known as apocalyptic literature. Now, the the culture, the popular culture around us has taught us to think of apocalyptic literature as predictions, as kind of roadmaps that tell us what is going to come, especially in the end times. But that's not the way that such passages functioned for those who first heard Luke's gospel. Rather, these apocalyptic passages, both here in Luke and in other places, they were offered to help believers who were struggling from oppression and persecution to put their struggles into the larger context of a universal struggle between God and the forces of evil. These passages were intended to bring comfort and hope and strength that no matter how difficult things became, God would not abandon them and God would ultimately prevail. In the face of much opposition, people of faith were to hold on to the promises of God, to the knowledge that God was still in control, and to witness to their faith in difficult times. Luke, the Gospel writer Luke, was writing his story of Jesus for Christians who were experiencing intense persecution for their faith. And that's not exactly our predicament as Christians in the United States today. The culture around us is much more likely to be apathetic to our faith and hostile to it. And yet I think there are times and situations in the life of every believer when it seems like the world as we know it might be coming to an end and that everything we hold most dear is crumbling around us. A difficult diagnosis that threatens our health or the health of someone near and dear to us. A job loss and financial uncertainty. The death of a beloved friend or life partner a broken relationship that our best efforts cannot fix. All of these things can shake the world as we know it, and with it, our faith. But in the face of fear and uncertainty, the message of the Scripture is that God remains present in our lives and in the world, and where there is God, there is always hope. And new life. This morning's gospel is meant to offer hope and encouragement to believers who are feeling threatened and uncertain about their future. Today, in our worship, we are coming together following the election of a new president. Donald J. Trump will become the 45th president of the United States of America. And many of you are excited about it, and many of you are despairing about it. Some of you don't know how to feel about it. But I think it's fair to say that almost all of us are exhausted and feeling wrung out by the length, duration, and tone of this year's election. And I think that this morning's Gospel reading, on the Sunday following this election, provides us with an important reminder that God is still in control. In our worship this Sunday, as every Sunday, we come to give thanks for God's love for this world, for the whole world. And that means that Republicans, Democrats, rich, poor, women, men, young, old, persons of all races and ethnicity, God loves us all even the people you're having a hard time liking or loving. And we are united here, not by gender or race or economic status or political affiliation, but by faith. Faith that God has created all things and all people, and God has promised not to give up on any of us, but to love us and by that love redeem us. The bishop of our ELCA, 
Elizabeth Eaton spoke about the election this week. And she reminded us that whether we are feeling joyful or sorrowful about the results, our faith tells us that ultimately no human candidate can guarantee our life or our future. That is the work that God has done through the cross and resurrection of Jesus. And in the waters of baptism, God has joined our life to Christ's life and has given us the gift of a calling to be the people of God, disciples of Jesus in the world today. This gospel today reminds us that even in the midst of desperate situations, maybe especially in the face of desperate situations, we are called to witness to our faith. As people of faith, we're never left without possibilities and power. Our faith tells us that we are called to see all people as created in the image of God and people who have inherent worth. Our faith calls us to pray, to pray for our country, for those who are elected, and for understanding. And then, then the church is called to get to work and to do those things that we have always done, that have been always at the heart of living out the gospel of Jesus Christ, welcoming the stranger, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, standing with and for the least and the last, and working for justice and peace in the name of Jesus, who is our hope and our life and our peace. This month, we've been talking about stewardship. Thanks to Gretchen today for giving us another good opportunity to think about what it's all about. And each one of us is being asked once again to consider our financial commitment to sustaining and building up the work of Jesus through this community of faith. How we live and how we give are an important part of living faith. And we are called in our worship and in our life together, in our outreach, to keep witnessing to our faith, to tell the story of Jesus in word and in action to one another and to the world. We are called to embody the story of Jesus who emptied himself of his power and privilege to bring healing and new life to a world that was wounded and in need. We need to lift up the gospel word that each person is loved and valued by the God who created them. We need to remind one another and this world again and again that God is still in control. Last Sunday morning, the world was a broken place, and it is still broken today. But we're not to despair. We're to live with hope, because the world is also full of God's grace and love. And our baptismal calling, our calling in Christ, remains the same, to trust in God even when we're facing the most challenging of circumstances, and to live the faith we've been gifted with in baptism, sharing the love of God in Jesus with one another and the world. Amen.